Well, thank you very much uh, for coming along this morning to our um, memorial lecture, uh, which was being held jointly uh, on the Hartley Colliery disaster. Um, I'm the on secretary of the uh, Newcastle uh, North of, Newcastle Mining Institute, or North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers, and uh, I'm going to pass you over to our president Steve to do the introductions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, this is an introduction to a lecture by uh, Norman Jackson to mark the anniversary of the Hartley Pit disaster of 1862, where 204 people died tragically and resulted in a change in legislation demanding two shafts to each mine to facilitate uh, escape in such situations. Uh, due to COVID and the necessity to keep isolated, Norman has agreed to give this talk in lieu of a church service. Norman, Norman Jackson is a, a fellow and past president of the Northeast Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers, serving as president from 1999 to 2000, and is also a past president of Sunderland Mining Society. He is currently a member of the Mining Technology Board of the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining Institute, of which he is also a fellow. Norman was head of technical service for the Corporation Northeast, from 1988 to 1993, and was a project leader in the privatization of the British Coal Corporation. Since leaving BCC, Norman has become a well-respected independent consultant in mining and management internationally, and has worked in association with many clients in mining and related industries. He is a recognized strategic thinker with a proven track record and is highly valued expert witness in the courts in these subjects. I now pass you on to Norman to relate the details of this horrific incident. Norman. Thank you, President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I have the first slide, please? I'm delighted to be given this opportunity of presenting this paper to you. Uh, as my first slide indicates, I'll offer you my version of the Hartley disaster, which I presented to the North of England Institute in January 2012 as a memorial to the incident that happened 100 and over 150 years ago. I've delivered the lecture several times on the anniversary of the accident, including in Johannesburg at the International Mining History Congress in 2012. As the president said, the terrible impact of the horrid uh, COVID-19 virus has impacted so much on all of us. It's uh, severely disrupted all our normal activities. The traditional church service and the memorial concert and other events are not possible this year. So to partially fill this uh, void, the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers has asked me to, on their behalf, to deliver this paper. It's an acknowledgement to the Hartley Disaster Committee who have done such sterling work, tremendous work over many years, keeping this awful accident as a reminder of all the injustices of the past. It's particularly relevant at this time owing to the sad passing of John Seymour on the 7th of November this year. He was a huge contributor to the Memorial Garden and a man deeply respected in the village of Hartley. I have many connections with Hartley. I did my first pit shift at the adjacent uh, Seaton Delaville Colliery in 1958, over 50 years ago. Seaton Suits, where I live, uh, I ex exported much of the coal produced at Hartley, and actually my home overlies the workings of the mine. I'm conscious today that we have a very mixed audience of some mining people. And I've, I think I've chosen the right balance between technical and non-technical material. I'll attempt to describe the events that took place in a manner that's readily understandable to all. In doing my background research, I've become even more aware of the tremendous database of the original material that we're attempting to preserve in our institute in Newcastle. And I commend anyone interested to search out some of this material and in particular, the account of one of our early members, Mr. George Baker Foster, and also the inquiry of the report by, prepared by J.K. Blackwell, Inspector of Mines for the Midlands. 
I researched all the other documents of the time and I believe that these accounts are the most accurate, but I find many of the press reports of the time are very varied. So I've based my presentation on the records of the papers that were presented to the Institute in 1862 and the records of the inquiry and the inquest that followed. However, some of the opinions and descriptions are my own based on my experiences that I've been privileged to have observed during my career. There are many brave stories to be told in the various publications that have been produced over the years, and time will only permit me to give you a brief insight into many of the brave people, including those who sadly lost their lives. Slide two, my approach. My approach, please. It's not. Um... My approach is today is to look at eight main topics. The historic setting of the local area, partly colliery as it was at the time of the accident, the accident itself, and what appeared to have happened. The recovery of the survivors and the bodies, the funeral, and the horrible, horrendous personal tragedies, the inquiry, changes to the legislation, and 159 years later, as things are today. Slide three, please. The history of coal mining in the locality. Mining in Northumberland has been carried out since Roman times, with records of workings existing in 1236 in the town of Blythe. These earliest records of mining in England show the Moorland scene was worked along and near its outcrop, westwards from Cookham to Bebside. Site investigation boreholes within the township of Blythe have confirmed the existence of unrecorded coal mining at very shallow depths. This slide shows the positions of many of the local shafts that had developed from the, gradually from the coast inland. The location of the Hester shaft, the one we're going to talk about, and the important port of Seton Sluice helped to identify the area. And for those of you from a, a distance, the area is on the coast, some 12 miles north of Newcastle. Slide four, please. The principal cause of the Hartley disaster is, of course, the well known fact that there was only a single access into the mine, which was very common practice for that period. Records show that when the Hartley disaster occurred, 10 of the 11 mines operating in the locality were single shaft mines. This slide is an example of one of the earliest board and pillar workings, quite clearly seen accessing from a single shaft. Two sites have actual plans of the workings. They are located near Babeside and further north on the banks of the River Blythe. For those who are from the locality, I've superimposed the spine road to help the orientation for those who know Northumberland. Slide five, please. For non-mining people, we're now very fortunate that open cast mining lets us look back at some of the early methods of mining, just as it would have been at the time of Hartley, at the time of the accident. This is a photograph I took recently at the high main scene at Ashington Portland Burn open cast site, somewhat north of New Hartley. You can see quite clearly at very shallow depth, some at this point, some 10 meters below the surface the roadways which formed the coal extraction and the small pillars that were left, hopefully, to keep up the roof. I've shown a little picture of a miner in the bottom corner there for you. Slide six, coal mining at Old Hartley. The first reference to the Old Hartley pits is made in the book History of Northumberland, and this records the date again of 1292. The location of these original mines is between the Briar Dean at Whitley Bay and the Seton Bird at Seton Plus. The National Trust Seton Delver Hall now owns much of this area. 
No record of the actual workings exists, but this plan extract indicates the position of the various shafts that have been located over time. In my opinion, they were likely to have been single shaft operations, but either by design or by accident, there can be no doubt that many of the workings were interconnected. As a result, in 1844, these mines were inundated with water and they were abandoned. At this time, Seatmouth was of huge importance as the main shipping point. If time permitted, there's a complete paper that could be given about the events of the port at that time. This period, ladies and gentlemen, was the development of early steam engines and the winders of, for the winders of coal and for pumping. The small circles you can see are the shafts. In many cases, there was at least one of these in each of the fields. Slide seven. It was decided to open a new mine and on the 1st of January, 1845, the sinking of New Hartley Hester Saft commenced and reached the lower main sea on the 29th of May, 1846, at a depth of just over 600 feet. My table shows the various data. And for the benefit of the older members, the information is in fathoms, and for the younger members in metres. The rate of sinking averaged at almost three metres per week, which is a phenomenal rate of progress considering the primitive mining methods of that time. It was sunk by William Coulson and his team, who will feature later in this paper. The first steam, the utmost seam, the high main was reached at 223 feet. Then the yard seam at 418, and the, finally the lowest, the lower main, at 583. The bottom of the shaft, where all the mortar was dealt with, was established at 601 feet. The shaft was driven 12 feet 6 inches in diameter, and significantly it was only brick lined to rock head about 30 feet down. The rest of the shaft was lined with wood, and the significance of this will be discussed later. Records of the time indicate large feeders of water coming out of the shaft side. The need for two shafts was well known at this time. It had been considered by the owners many times, but had been rejected as being too costly. One comment from uh, the London industry at the time, which I'd like to quote, I think it's very, very apt. One very obvious meaning, method rather, of diminishing risk to workmen in coal, coal pits was the provision of a duplicate means of entry and exit. It cannot be pretended, indeed the catastrophe at Hartley Pit was needed to suggest that was, this was a common sense precaution. The habits of every animal that burrows into the ground to say nothing of mining experience of men capable of reflection, to say nothing of the mining experience that were capable of reflection must long since demonstrate the reckless negligence of men congregating in narrow passages running hundreds of feet beneath the earth's surface without opening for them some other means of returning to light and to home other than by the single one which they had descended to their work. A very sobering thought. Slide. Eight general arrangements of the shaft. This slide diagrammatically illustrates the general arrangements. The shaft was partitioned into two, separated by three inch wood planks to provide intake and return roadways. The intake side contained two cages, which provided transport for the main and materials and the winding of coal. The return side incorporated the main pumping system for what was be to become a very wet mine. In addition to the main shaft, there was also an adjacent a small staple shaft, which was sunk to just below the high main seam. It was utilized for pumping, but it was equipped with a small jack engine to access for that level. The means for communication within the main shaft and to the surface was for th by three separate bail ropes each interconnected to the three seams. These proved important later during the rescue of the men 
trapped in the cage. Whilst there's no description in any of the historic documentation of any additional supports or buntings in the shaft, they were obviously present to support the cage guides and the pump ranges. We now have a picture of the huge amount of timber and ironwork in the shaft, a disaster waiting to happen. Slide nine. The 1852 inrush. In the period following the shaft sinking, working was very difficult with water proving a major problem. Similar conditions to that had caused the closure of the old collieries. On the 14th of February, 1852, an immense speed of water inundated the mine. Similar to the incident, some of you may remember in Wales, some 11 years ago, the mine had intersected some old workings which were filled with water, a vast amount of water. The existing pumping system was overcome. It had proved totally inadequate, and it was extremely fortunate that before the shaft was flooded, that the men and horses working underground at the time were managed to be rescued. No doubt, a very close shave. Slide 10. The new pumping system. At the time of this latest inrush, coal was of tremendous demand, and the mine owners immediately commissioned the installation of a new powerful pump. This huge machine of its time was powered by a 400 horsepower condensing steam engine. We're fortunate at the Institute to have a copy of the original drawing of the complete installation. Depicting the system before and after the accident. I've placed an enlarged copy of this, um, which is available in the library for those wishing to see it. It's reputed that when pumping at full capacity, it could handle 1,500 gallons a minute of water. The obvious concern to present mining engineer was that there was no spare pump, and therefore, how could proper maintenance schedules be carried out? It's essential to have a broad understanding of the workings of the system to be able to picture what went wrong. And I'll try and give you a brief resume. The picture shows the surface and initial shaft arrangements. It was a pumping beam and a counterbalance with a single massive beam operating three pumps. The beam was 35 feet long and 43 tons in weight. Effectively, it was a three-stage pump, pumping from the lower main to the yard seam, the yard seam to the high main, and finally from the high main to the surface via the surface stopper. Slide 11. The pump mechanism. The pump rods, you see those on the left, were made of hardwood, 12 inches square and 21 feet long initially and the middle and lower set were 10 inches square. They were made from memel, which is an imported oak, Polish oak. British oak was in short supply due to the man, demands of the warships of the time. They were joined together to form a column, either by iron plates or possibly chains to allow, allow some flexibility. It's calculated that some 55 tons of weight were suspended from the beam. The pump rods, or spears as they were called, were classified in two ways. When they were within the pump barrel, they were obviously in water. But in the upper section, where, it was, where they weren't, then they were known as dry spears. They obviously, uh, where they weren't in the pump barrels, they were uh, variable by temperature and the, the, the amount of water that was available to them. The pump barrels were cast iron and riveted plate. The lower pumps were 24 inches in diameter and the upper set of pipes were 30 inches in diameter, huge and heavy pieces of equipment. The pump action was a simple plump plunger mechanism with the water on the downstroke, which you can see on the left side, pushing open the valves and as they were raised, it closed the valve. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the nightmare of this heavy equipment 
being installed and maintained within the shaft. Having spent a year during the miner's strike as part of a small shaft and winder maintenance team, I'm very aware of the dangers, and I have the utmost admiration for the skill and in ingenuity of the engineers of that time. But I would now like you to picture the additional wood and iron in a highly congested 12 foot 6 inches diameter shaft. Installation and access to the pumping equipment was, was enabled by an auxiliary jack engine winch, which was important in the rescue attempts that were to follow. Slide 12. The broken beam. 16th of January, 1862, about this time in the morning. And a winter's day, probably like it is today. The main change in the shift was taking place. And as was normal practice, the men and boys changed shift underground. And as a result, twice the normal number were present at this time. The back shift had gone down and the fore shift was still in the pit. And as we now knew, over 200. 17 men had been wound to the surface and eight men were in the cage, four in the top deck and four in the bottom when suddenly, without warning, the main pumping beam snapped in two and immediately was pulled down the shaft. Slide 13. The incident, Thursday, 16th of January, mid-morning. I would now like to imagine the picture of devastation that that beam disappearing down the shaft would present. The noise of breaking timber and the falling of iron into the shaft partition and the pumping system being carried away. The people at the shaft top and the winding engines initial short thoughts were for the eight men in the cage, with the winder coming to immediate halt as the beam hit the cage. It transpired that half the main beam, some 21 tons in, in, in weight, had met the cage between the high main and the yard seam, about 30 feet below the high main, completely blocking the shaft with debris. New electronic signals to assist. The only way to communicate was just shouting down the shaft. The rescue attempt was immediately implemented with a party of men going down the pumping staple, lured down by the jack engine and began clearing the wreckage that had formed at the high main seam inset. By mid-morning, they'd managed to get the jack rope in the main shaft through the debris, but before this, they'd also managed to lure light from the high main down to the survivors. The first of many disasters then occurred. The jack engine was lured down and guided to the cage with a loop attached. One man called Sharp got in, but unfortunately coming up, he got stuck in the debris and was pulled out of the loop and fell to his death. This was the first known casualty. Two men were then successfully brought to safety. It's right, I think, that we pay tribute to one of the first heroes, Tom Watson, the cool hewer, who was in the cage with the other survivors. Hearing the cries from help from a dying man suspended below in the debris, he got out of what remained of the cage and using the sharp signal rules, he lured himself down and stayed and prayed with the man until he died. Watson was the third of the only survivors who subsequently climbed back to safety and survived and he provided important evidence at the inquest where he explained it was not until 10 o'clock that night that he was actually rescued. Slide 14. The cages the rescue attempt for the men below began to proceed. And by now, the viewers and other officials had been alerted and assembled in the high main, where they immediately began erecting temporary scaffolding in the shaft to prevent debris falling down. During Thursday night, they managed to get the cages to the surface, which allowed the, the rope to be taken off, and the winder then allowed to be used to lure men down to begin clearing the shaft cage on the left is, uh, is shown as it was normally 
and on the right after the accident. Slide 15. Descend in the shaft. Now the cages were removed, it was possible for rescuers to descend the shaft being lowered down in sling. The size of the problem then began to emerge. The ventilation, breakfast structure, supporting wood beams, pump rods and pumps had formed a complete blockage immediately above the yard room furnace grip. The difficulty of this operation shouldn't be underestimated. Conti continuous stream of water from the broken pump ranges from the shaft feeders poured down on the men working with only candles and lamps for light. No proper ventilation and smoke and fumes coming up from remains of the furnace fire. During the day, the initial colliery rescue teams were joined by William Coulson and his team of shaft sinkers. It appears they happened to be passing on a train heading north to another shaft sinking. When the train stopped at Hartley Station, they saw the commotion and immediately offered their services. Slide 16. William Coulson and his team. I'm not going to attempt to give full details of William Coulson's achievements in mining. Sufficient to say that in addition to the Hartley Hester shaft, he was responsible for sinking 84 other shafts in the northern coal field at this time. I'll only comment that shaft sinking is one of the most dangerous jobs in the industry, requiring skill, strength, and tremendous ingenuity. The extended Coulson family were heavily involved in mining over a long period. And in my research, I found that 26 members of that family were killed in mining accidents. There appears to be some delay for the parties involved in the initial efforts to realize the significance of Coulson. And it wasn't until mid-afternoon on Friday the 17th that Coulson was asked to head up the rescue attempt. His first task was to descend the shaft alone for his first assessment. His evidence indicates that the shaft was totally obstructed some 30 feet above the yard seam. Slide 17, the rescue team. There appears to be no shortage of volunteers of both management and main wishing to help. The list of viewers reads like a who's who of the mining world with our own Nicholas Wood having been recorded as offering his advice. Men from many mines in the locality were present in huge numbers and the pick of these was organized into teams working for two hours at a time, clearing the debris up to the yard scene, the high main scene rather, where it was stored into old roadways. Periodically all work was stopped as sounds could be heard from the trapped men below. Being so successful, Coulson had gathered around him a very experienced band of sinker. Everyone was a professional in his own right. Among them was his old son, William, and Jordy Emerson, his right-hand man. Billy Shields, Davy Wilkinson were there. These were the sinkers that arrived at the colliery on that bleak and cool day, offering their services to try and save the entombed unfortunate men. Along with many other skilled men from the adjacent mines, they formed the core of rescuers. Slide 18, waiting for news. The work of clearing the shaft continued with tolerable success, which much of the timber reduced to matchwood. They worked from temporary scaffolding, loaded into buckets attached to the jack engine wheel, raising the debris to the high main, where other teams were split up and stored it into old railways. During the day, unfortunately, the sides of the shaft began to break away and the falling stone proved too dangerous to continue. And a 12 hour delay ensued whilst days were put in to support the cavity. The lack of proper lining in the shaft had become evident. During this time, the tension and anxiety of those waiting for news was actually building very heavily. Slide 19. This slide is a copy of the original section depicting the accident which was produced at the time and it was used in 
many of the illustrations in the newspapers. Sunday the 19th, this morning it was assessed that a point some 30 feet above the arc scene had been reached. Temporary support above this level was now deemed adequate for the work to proceed, and the sinkers began to excavate the debris round the side of the pumps to try and reach the top of the furnace drift. This was to try and bypass the blockage and thereby shorten the access to the arc scene. The debris at this point was so solid that progress was slow and the jack engine was attached directly to the jam material and large pieces hauled out. Picture the difficulty of relaying messages to the controller of the jack engine at the surface. Many other schemes were contemplated to try and speed up the operation at this time, including to try and get down inside the pump casing. But these ideas were dismissed quite rightly as being impractical. Hopes were high at this point in time, but it was felt that access via the pump connecting passages would allow early access to the yard scene. Slide 20. Monday the 20th. No great change in the method of working during the day, as access to the yard scene was progressing, and it was expected that entry would be made by nightfall. Up to this time, it was thought that the men below were in no great danger, apart from being tired and hungry. It was known that an escape route was well established from the working scene, the lower scene, up a vertical staple equipped with a steel ladder, a climb of about 100 feet. This staple was sunk on the instructions of the mines inspectorate some years earlier to allow escape from the lower scene as if the mine flooded. Sadly, no further connection between the yard scene to the high main had been made. Sounds from the main had clearly been heard on Friday. Mine staff had assured the sinkers that normal mine gases of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and methane were not a problem. And that the main had, a, had an opportunity of access to fresh water. And there was also a quantity of oats present for the ponies, which would provide subsidence. Unfortunately, during the day, a new enemy began to emerge. Movement of air in the shaft began to change, and the vapor thought at first to be smoke was observed coming out of the pumps and began to force the limited fresh air out of the shaft. During the night, the sinkers began to be affected by gas, showing symptoms of sickness and nausea when they came to the surface. Thought at first that this was likely to be stiff, but as the lamps were not extinguished, and by the fact that the flames increased on the lamps, it was deduced that it had to be the more deadly carbon monoxide. Slide 21, Tuesday the 21st. Early in the morning, preparing to enter the shut yard scene, the workers extracted a large timber blockage and immediately large volumes of gas began to emit, resulting in the main having to be withdrawn, including those in the high main. All of the main were declared extremely ill. It became immediately obvious that the brightness had to be established and extended down the yard scene, and ventilation re-established before work could resume safely. The complexity and ingenuity of this uh, operation shouldn't be underestimated. In addition to the brass work, one of the boiler fires was connected with a high main seam stopper via the crab engine duct rope to increase the ventilation pool by using the chimney of that fire to heat a column of air. The fate of the men and boys trapped below had obviously now become an increased concern, and press reports indicate considerable un unrest at the rate of progress. Indeed, a strong crowd at the crowd at the mine were threatening Coulson and his team to the extent that a local preacher was required to intervene in calm proceedings. Slide 22. <clears throat> this slide is a copy of the accident plan that I believe was used both at the inquest and in the inquiry. During the day, Work was sufficiently advanced for the sinkers to make a small entrance 
into the furnace drift, where they found the gas was so strong it was some time before it would affect entry. Three miners, Bill Adams from Coopan, Bob Wilson and Thomas Coulson, Coop cousins rather, from Backwell to over and entered the furnace drift. The evidence of the men having put out the furnace fire and forcing their way into the drift was seen and they had been trying to clear a way out. The wood re rescuers then proceeded into the drift and their worst fears were confirmed. All men and boys, 199 of them, were found dead. This plan, used at the inquest, confirms the positions of where the bodies were located, small crosses. The various messages found confirmed the events that had taken place. As suspected, James Arthur, the backshift woman, a highly respected and no doubt extremely brave man, in horrendous circumstances, had assembled his men and boys and had led them via the stop of the yard scheme to await rescue. No doubt their final place of resting was where the last remnants of fresh air were present. It's difficult to examine the awful scene facing the rescue team. Both families of men and boys clashed together as they died. Many of the messages of these deeply religious people record the various deliberations as they prepared to die. Having ascertained that there were no survivors, it was decided that to make the shaft more safe and secure was essential before the recovery could proceed in a safer manner. Slide 23. Thursday and Friday, the 23rd and 24th. We were occupied in carrying out additional shoring up of the shaft and sty, supporting the pumps which had fallen across the shaft. The shaft at this point, probably because it didn't have a brick or stone walling, had formed a cavity some 30 feet wide. Debris, of course, was extremely heavy with columns of cast iron pumps in a dangerous condition. Huge beams of timber were lowered down and secured to prevent further movement. Gas continued to be an intermittent problem. And of course, de decomposition of the bodies had begun. It was originally thought that the best solution for recovery or for the bodies was for them to be coffined underground. But this was deemed to be not practicable because the coffins wouldn't be able to pass through the obstructions as they came to the surface. Slide 24. Saturday, the 25th. By 10 o'clock, all was ready to bring the bodies to the surface. Fresh air had been established to the yard seam level and was deemed safe for the recovery to begin. Foster, in his paper given to the Northeast Institute, records the following statement. As some of the bodies were considerably decomposed, it was deemed necessary by medical men to have a good supply of chloride and lime for everyone who was present and for them to be supply, supplied with a pair of strong leather gloves. The first body reached the surface at half past ten. Parties of men from other collieries were utilised to bring from the, main, the men from the positions they were found to the shaft where they were met by the sinkers, who travelled up the shaft guiding the bodies the, past the remaining obstacles. Sunday the 26th. 159 years ago. The awful job continued for 17 hours until half past three on Sunday morning, when all the 199 bodies in the vicinity of the shaft were brought to the surface. A misunderstanding had arisen as to exactly how many men were un underground at the time, and a complete searching of the available workings was carried out. It was thorough and extended to the Lumian Stapel where it was found that it was flooded to within 70 feet of the yard seam. It confirmed that the bodies of all those trapped had been recovered. There's little reference to the 43 ponies that had perished, other than the fact that they were no doubt would have helped to reduce the available fresh air. Slide 25, the funeral procession. 
It's hard to imagine the scene when the last body was recovered, but almost every house in the locality contained a coffin, and in so many. Huge crowds had gathered on that awful Sunday the 26th, and preparations had already made made for a mass grave to be prepared in Erzman Church. A poem by Cook, written some time after, contains a verse that describes the scene better than any words that I could ever write, and I would like to quote it. In every house there was a bed, and coffins black with silent dread. We looked within the cottage doors, and there they lay in twos and threes and fours. Into every end house of the row lay seven coffins there to be hold, with seven little, stiff and cold. I saw them piled together, lying one upon another. The records of the scenes of this tragedy can only be gleaned from the press reports of the time, and the London Illustrated News and the Newcastle Current provide graphic descriptions. And this slide indicates the funeral procession, which covered some three miles, with the last hearse still at Hartley when the first arrived at, Zer at Erzden. A small number of bodies were interned at Cramlington, Coopen and Stag Hill. Slide 26. The burial. The existing graveyard wasn't big enough to support the number of graves required. It already contained 75 miners from the Burrard and Pit explosion, which had occurred some two years earlier. An extension was required, and a gap was made in the churchyard wall to the adjoining field. Some 50 men were employed. Digging graves, they worked non-stop from dawn Saturday until dark on Sunday evening. Digging was still proceeding when the bodies were being buried. Slide 27. The first inquest. As the desperate work to clear the shaft was proceeding, and hope still existed that the, the inquest on the five vein and the kill of the shaft was opened. It took place on Monday the 20th of January 1862 at the Hastings Arms Inn. The in inquest was held before the coroner, Mr. Stephen Reed. Matthias Dunn, Inspector for Mines of Northumberland, gave evidence as to the cause of death, and details of which were recorded in the Newcastle Covenant of 1862. The recorded verdict was given that the men in the shaft were killed by the accidentally breaking of a, the engine beam and it falling into the shaft and causing their death. The main inquest. The main inquest on the entomb was held on the 3rd and 6th of February 1862 was held in the United Methodist Church Chapel at Seaton Delaville, again with the coroner, Mr. Stephen Reed, Kenyon Blackman, a highly respected mining engineer of natural repute, was an order to attend by the Home Secretary. His role was to assist the coroner on technical matters and ultimately re produce a report on the proceedings. Amongst other witnesses were Matthias Dunn, inspector of mines for the Midlands, and T. Foster and G. B. Foster, mining engineers, and viewers were early members of our institute to give evidence. Some of the evidence makes very harrowing reading, with many of the aspects of injustice of the time relating to the working conditions being very apparent. The immense bravery of the attempted rescuers provides very sobering thought. Slide 29. The verdict of that inquest uh, was reached and it reads, as a result of the engine beaming breaking down, sorry. The verdict reads, as a result of the engine beam breaking and falling into blocking the shaft, the man died from inhalation of gas being entombed in the yard scene as all access to escape had been cut off. The jury also recorded their views on three issues. All quarries should have at least a second chapter outlet to afford main means of escape. 
In future, all beams of Colby engines should be of malleable instead of cast metal. The jury took notice and was recorded with admiration the heroic courage of the viewers and others who devoted their skill and energy to do everything possible in the attempt at rescue. Slide 30, the heroes. It's perhaps wrong to single out individuals or groups, but I have my own thoughts on those who I'd like to mention that I've uh, concluded in looking at my evidence. First one, Tom Watson, who survived, he climbed down the shaft and prayed with a dying man. James Armour, the high respected back woman, who doubt, no doubt calmly led the men from the lower main of the Staple to the yard scene, where he assembled them with their families to await rescue, but sadly never came. To the men and boys, whose suffering was difficult to comprehend, no doubt assisted by the brave souls who conducted prayers for their rescue. The immense courage of William Coulson and his team, and the, <clears throat> and the medics and the volunteers from Hartley and from other colleagues. And to the viewers, the managers of the time, who carried the ultimate responsibility in the direction of these very superhuman efforts. Many of the people received, later received recognition in the form of gold, silver, and bronze medals. My thoughts would be that they all deserve the highest of commendation. Slide 31. The medics. One group of men I haven't mentioned yet are the members of the medical profession who made a very valuable contribution to this awful task. The heart colliery surgeon, Dr. Anthony Davison, together with those of the local doctors, Drs. Dawson White from the castle, Dr. Pyle and his son from Erston are recorded as being present from the outset, day and night, treating the various in in injuries and the gas and inhalations that occurred. Mr. Ambrose, a surgeon who happened to be on a ship at Blythe at the time, was in attendance together with Drs. Nickel and McAllister and Ward. All of these men volunteer to go into the furnace drift if required. One of the awful duties of them was to assist in the identification of the victims and to pronounce the cause of death. No postmortems were ever carried out uh, on the gas simulation, but in a detailed letter to the Lancet, Dr. Davison described his fully assessment of the cause of death was by gas inhalation. Slide 32, the aftermath. In the aftermath of the tragedy, there was a huge national interest and indignation as to the cause. This feeling was laid by the press of the time with the London Illustrated Times and the Newcastle Current, the greatest voices in the world, the Times also highlighting the issue. The scandal that because of cost, mine owners have failed to provide a second means of egress. The campaign of the miners was really a separate paper and is really the forerunner of what was to become the mining union. It highlighted the huge social issues that existed and the lack of safety due to profit motives on behalf of the owners. The mines inspectors reports highlighted the shortcomings of the existing system and emphasized the need for changes in the legislative process. The influence of the North of England Institute of Mining Engineer is also important as they effectively conducted their own inquiry into the tragedy and effectively lobbied for change. Next slide, 33, the Act. As a result of the tremendous pressure exerted by all parties, it had its effect on the government and an Act amending the law relating to coal mines was passed on the 7th of August, 1862. It became the law, it's unlawful for a mine owner to employ persons in such a mine unless there are at least two shafts or outlets separated by an actual starter, not less than 10 feet in breadth. These shafts were required to provide distinct means of ingress and egress to persons employed in the mine and were applicable to all mines 
from the 1st of January 1865. This special act was also consolidated into the Coal Mine Regulations Act of 1872. July 34, 159 years later. Should my paper have raised interest with people of not knowing the locality or indeed be aware of the strong local feeling that still binds people together, can I suggest you take a short trip around some of the sites that I've mentioned? Perhaps it'll complete the picture of what I've been attempting to describe. Slide 35. Start at Seton Sluice, the harbour where much of the coal was shipped. The village is now a peaceful little fishing harbour. In front of the King's Arms is an information plaque giving a brief history. 150 years ago, it was a site of major industry, with local coal being shipped in large quantities to the many receiving ports. It was also the home of the then famous Royal Hartley Bottle Works. Slide 36. Cross over the Seaton Dome, take a short drive up the avenue, past the former coal owner's house, Seaton Delible Home. You should take the time to read the book, The Gear Delivers, the story of the powerful, powerful Northumberland family owning land and coal mines. The estate, which is now, which was owned by Lord Hastings, has now been taken over by the National Trust, and it is being fully maintained. Slide thirty-seven. At the hall, turn right. In a short, in a short distance, you will find the Memorial Garden, a new hearty site of the Hester Shaft. The garden has had major improvement over the years. 1976, it was some works were funded by the NUM and local contributions, and the works continued each year. Attributable to John Seymour, many of his help helpers, it now uh, continues to be a peaceful ha haven where you can readily find the paper shop and the engine house in that lovely area. Slide 38. This is the area, and each year in the village, the Memorial Committee ought to be commended for their efforts in organizing concerts, church services, and other events as a reminder of the past. Obviously, not possible this year, and hence today, this is our tribute from the North of England to that, all of that work. I'll give you a moment just to see that. And I'll move on to slide 39. Take your time and, and reflect and make the short journey to the pretty village of Ursley. Here you'll find St. Anvil's Church, which is on the west side of the village. Don't be misled by the monument at the entrance to the church in churchyard. Head round the church towards the sea, and there you'll find the Hartley Monument. Slide 40, please. It's not difficult to find, and I think anyone standing there will find it extremely moving. My next slide, slide 41, is worth contemplating on. On the four slides are listed the names of the people who, who were lost, and perhaps the most poignant is the one that I've highlighted, the tragic little family. Take note of the ages, the youngest, nearly 10 years old. Slide 42. In conclusion, for anyone wishing to obtain more facts, I would encourage you to visit the Mining Institute. It's a wonderful building. It's the home of unique records and has now an assured future. 
the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers has handed over the building and assets to a new charity, the Common Room North. And together, we su succeeded in securing a £17 million heritage lottery grant for a complete refurbishment of the building, including full disabled access. The works are now complete. And within weeks, God willing, we will reopen the world with world-class conference and function centre, including our northeast of England headquarters. I, I've just had notification actually that the keys for the refurbishment will be handed over on Monday of next week. But during the COVID, there will be further restrictions. In conclusion, I would like to close with a verse of, from George Cook's poem, The Hearty Calamity. Ten score years of, li of lives have proved it true. The one shaft system will not do. A horrid system, one way out, has slain its hundred, there's no doubt. May Hartley in the memory live, a death blow to the system give. Finally, in my acknowledgement, I'd like to uh, thank the assistance in my research given by, by the library team at the Institute but in particular to David Bale and uh, Matthew Funnell, our IT experts who have assisted me in putting this uh, system uh, into place this morning. I'd also like to member, mention one of our members who's now deceased, David Little, who sponsored the republishment of McCutcheon's book, The Hartley Curry Disaster. David presented me a copy of this when I became president and it kindled my interest in the tragedy. Could I close with slide 45? Ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you and paying a tribute to our memory of the tragic event. Can I finally say, stay safe? Thank you. Uh, Keith Hayes uh, said, during the late 1960s, I remember a small piece of the beam that fell down the shaft at Hartley being in a display cabinet at the entrance hall into the mining department. And he wonders what happened to it. And then he asked, are some of the slide images taken from Thomas Hare etchings? Yes, they are. And uh, fortunately, the... the um the Institute has copies and, and some of the originals of Thomas Hare's work. Um, but yes, they are, they are effectively, all, all of the records are as presented in, in the records that are held at the Mining Institute at Newcastle. Uh, Susan Mills has contributed. I live opposite St Albans Church, start my local walk in the graveyard and see the memorial every time. Now my reflections of the experience of the whole community are far deeper. Thank you. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it, if I could just comment, it does affect you when you, when you go and stand there. And, and having been in mines for so long, to, to think about the duties of those 10 year old uh, boys working in the ground, most of them would be what we call trapper boys. They would uh, sit in the dark, we wouldn't have a light um, and they would open the ventilation doors to allow uh, tubs of coal to pass and, and uh, when, the, when the, the tubs had passed through they would close the doors. That was their, usually their type, the type of duties that they would do. Uh, on that point Isabel Berry asks, when were rules changed with regards to the age of children allowed to work in mines? They followed shortly after this incident. Uh, there were several amendments to the coal mines. I, I haven't got the, the, all of the dates, but they are well recorded in, in the various documentation. I could give these at a, at a later date, but I don't have them to hand uh, this morning. If I can contribute at that point, Norman, uh, they, they are actually the rules were better down the mines than they were in factories at the time. Uh, they had to work for less time. You're only allowed to be 10 years old if you could read. If you couldn't read, uh, 11 was the minimum age. Um, so Sheila Davis, I had no idea what a disaster. Thank you very much for your work and presentation. Brian 
Hollingwood, an excellent presentation, appropriate tribute. Thank you very much, Norman. And Les Abernathy of Erzden and Wellfield Community Association, many thanks for an in-depth presentation of this horrific accident. Uh, Maggie F asks, when was the tally system introduced into the mines? Well, I, I, that's another fact I, I, I cannot answer. Uh, I, I just don't know what that date offhand. I can, I can check it out from my records and, and uh, we can provide a, an answer on YouTube probably would be the best thing to do. I'll check that up and, and we'll, we'll put something on YouTube. Uh, yeah, uh, Maggie, we could also, if you email office at miningginstitute.org.uk, I will forward that on to Norman. Um, from James Hobson, whilst COVID has wrought ha its havoc, one silver lining is that it's meant that the, this, usual, this usually local presentation has been broadcast to my living room in Bewley, Worcestershire. Many thanks to you all. And Costas Manthos. Many thanks for your information, lectures, wishes from the mining city of Lavion, Greece. I think this is one of the one of the benefits of, of what we're trying to do here is, is make information more accessible to people. And one of the things that, that the, the new common room, hopefully, uh, part of the Heritage Lottery Grant, which is which is enabling this uh, tremendous project to uh, you know, to, to go forward. And I cannot wait to see the building once we're, once we're allowed back in it. It will be run by the common room. It's going to be given in a sure future. And one of their, one of their rules is, um, rules rather, through the grant, is to try and make information by, by uh, imaging more accessible and things will be accessible online. And people all over the world will be able to access many of these records quite properly. Uh, there's a few other questions about the younger stage, but I think we've touched upon those now, but certainly we'll put something uh, kind of uh, on the Facebook page as well. Um, Clive Seal contributes, think it was going on for 1870 when the age was changed, still 10 in 1869 um, in Rosendale. Yeah. Um, Keith Hayes has contributed, there's a poem written about Trapper Boy at Neville Hall. Robert Williams' successor showed it to me. <laughs> yeah. um, and Alistair Sundin, we're all 204 <laughs> miners buried at Erzden. No, I did see it in my paper. Some of them are buried at, um, at um, I think, the churchyards at Cramlick and Sake Hill. Just small numbers. The bulk of them were buried at, uh, at, at Erzden. Uh, Isabel Berry, thanks so much to you all. Extremely interesting and poignant. I'm now going to take my daughter for a walk in the Memorial Garden. Um, Alistair Sundin will be visiting the Memorial Erzden Church. Never realised this terrible tragedy had affected so many people and families. Uh, Keith Hayes, Neville Hall, wonderful building, studied and gave a paper there. A must visit. Uh, will this be available to share? Yes, we'll be tidying this up um, and it will become available from a link on the Learning um, the Mining Institute website. Um, so, Andrew, do you want to give the details for that whilst I read? Um, there was another question, uh, David. Um, it was, is, was there any pushback from the mine owners to the requirement for the second shaft? You know, I think uh, because because of the way the act came in, um, they they had no option to uh, other than to install the second shaft. It, it's quite interesting actually when you do read. Now it wasn't just also also a question of of uh, of cost. Many of the of the uh, ventilation engineers of that time felt that the single shaft method. Because there was no mechanical engine uh, um, ventilation at that time, it was nearly all by, by heated air. And uh, the single shaft ventilation, and a lot of these discussions are recorded in the early institute transactions, um, that there was an argument that for, for single shaft. 
obviously not the safety aspect, but the, the actual functioning of the ventilation system. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, uh, can I contribute there? Also, some mines, they created an underground link uh, to an adjacent mine, uh, and that was acceptable. Um, so there'd be kind of sealed doors between two locations. Contribution from, uh, sorry, uh, contribute Stuart Morley, were any of the poor families compensated? Well, actually, there is, a, there is an excellent book um, written by a lady called Raper to, to commemorate the, the 150th. And I, I've just been reading it. All of the information about the the relief fund, etc., including the Queen Victoria's donation, which I think was thirty pounds at the time. It, it reads quite tragically the compensation that people got. Uh, effectively, where families had lost sons, there was no uh, pensions or anything for the sons. They were just just normal. And one of the figures that I've seen is is a uh, widow has got something like one pound ten pence per week. To, to, uh, to live on. And uh, many of them were in tied houses and, and uh, ultimately lo they lost their tied houses. Many of them went back to, uh, to live with their, their, their other uh, extended families. It's quite wow. tragic how, how little compensation was made at that time. Um. You may be able to find on YouTube the Kate Humble, um, who do you think you are? Because some of that was actually filmed in the Mining Institute because her great, great, great grandfather uh, had been, was the actual the viewer uh, at this colliery. Um, so Shaila, many thanks for the extremely interesting lecture. I'd researched this a few years ago to take an O level in local history, refresh my memory uh, and Nigel Hall, yes, the talk will be on YouTube uh, and there will be a link from the Mining Institute website. Dave Patterson, thank you so much. Excellent and really interesting. We'll visit next time my travel from Yorkshire. Uh, there's a contribution from uh, Lancashire Mining Museum website says that the checking system was made law in 1930 by a supplementary amendment to the Coal Mines Act of 1911. That's from an ENCM. Well, that's cool. It saved me a little job. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question for you, Norman. Is what from Mickey Allen? Is water ingress still a problem in old underground workings in the area? A very good question. Um, the situation of, of uh, water in the whole of the Moorland coal field is, is very complex. Um, just, just for everyone's benefit. It's, it's split into various huge ponds. If you think about the area between, between uh, Whitley Bay and the Wardsbeck River, all of the mines in that locality are all interconnected, either deliberately or by accident. The, during the wartime connections were made between many mines so that in the event of a shaft being bombed, there was an escape route uh, for, 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 the, for the mines uh, to be evacuated. The, the, the water, since all the mines have closed, the water levels have, have now risen, risen almost to, to surface level. And the problem with when, when the water recovers in mines, and I'll just deal with that, that, that pond, is, is all now covered by a pumping system at Bates Colliery at Bly. And all the water is treated there from right away across from, from as I say, from Whitley Bay to the Wardbeck. All of the workings is dealt with there. The water is pumped to the surface. It comes to the surface. It's just below tidal level. Pump, pump it across through a series of lagoons where the lagoons take out the acidity in the water, the, the orange staining, and then the water is in a sufficient state to be di then discharged from those lagoons into the River Bly. And if anyone wants to have a look at that, if you look on Google, you can actually see just up from Bates Jetties, you can see where the water discharges. And it's discharged under a consent from the environment agency at a quality that doesn't affect wildlife. 
The rest of the area, um, north of the River Wandsbeck, is dealt with by a similar pumping system at uh, Lynemouth. And similarly, there are systems in Durham which are dealing with the ponds that are connected there. But the whole of that operation is now operated by the Coal Authority, as directed by the government. Right. Contribution from Jane Glass. Visiting, uh, visited Mining Institute a couple of times on group visits, and I'm pleased that a wonderful building has been renovated for the future. Uh, Lee Morrison's got a question. Who did actually own the mine at the time of the disaster? Um, I'll have to check that one. I've got the fact, but I haven't, I haven't got that readily to hand. Uh, Tracy Brannan, did the mine stay open after this horrific accident? Uh, no, the mine was, there was a new mine sunk, um, which, which opened two, two new shafts, just uh, a little bit north of the original position, which, which continued until the, uh, until the late 50s and it extracted the remaining amounts of coal. Uh, contribution from Alan Mitchell. I've actually been down a mine in Ashington Pit in 1970 on the training face, and it was quite eerie, going between the gate doors with a rush of air. Fascinating. And from John Fellows, the coroner Stephen Reed must take some of the blame for not putting blame for more, many disasters on the owners. Uh, and Isabel Berry says it was owned by Car and Co from 1850, Norman. Yes, so that's... I've got that here. I just, uh, I suppose I'm getting a bit old to remember all of these facts. I've got so many things whizzing around in my head. Yes, yes, that's fine. I, I have it all listed here. Well, that's the end of the questions. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take over this point? Um, I think we're we're just about there. I mean, is the Steve, um, are you, are you, do, do you have the vote, uh, a vote, final vote of thanks for Norman? Well, yes, I think uh, something should certainly be said on that score. And uh, on behalf of uh, Nimi and the, uh, the people of Hartley, I would like to thank you very, very much for reminding us of the horror and the seriousness of this terrible, tragic disaster. And thank you very much for that. And also the fact that, you know, you have explained very, very well to us all uh, that we should never forget these sort of things and that we've always got to move forward in our safety concerns. So on behalf of everyone at NEMI, thank you very much, Norman. Thank you, everyone. Just could I close by saying, stay safe, everybody. It's, it's awful times. We're all suffering. And perhaps we have filled a little, little gap in what wasn't possible to happen. But thank you all for listening. Thank you, Norman. Excellent. I, 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 think, that, I think that's it, David. Um, or, I think, or, or, all that's left to say really is um, if you'd like to find out more about the, uh, our institute and our work, please, uh, please do look us up either via our website or, or the information available on YouTube or any of our other social media platforms. Um, we do put on a range of, sort of other further excellent talks uh, and so we hope to see you again at that.